Hi everyone, welcome again to the course of structural biology. We are continuing with structural biology techniques. Currently, we are in the model of spectroscopy. Today, it is the second class of spectroscopy. We have talked about the general principles of spectroscopy, how different parts of spectro photometer works, what are the general principles. In today's talk, we will concentrate on mostly electronic transition with two techniques. One is UV visible and another is circular dichroism. Start with UV visible spectroscopy. Molecular UV visible spectroscopy is driven by electronic absorption of UV vis radiation. So, here the excitation affect the electronic level. Molecular UV visible spectroscopy can enable the structural analysis, detect molecular chromophores, the compounds which are specially showing difference, analyze light absorbing properties specially applicable for photochemistry. Spectroscopy of the electron surrounding an atom or a molecule is the electron energy level transition. So, atoms, electrons are in hydrogen like orbitals like S, P, D, F and in molecule electron are in molecular orbital, homo, lumo which is highest occupied molecular orbital, lumo lowest unoccupied molecular orbital. So, this is the uh, structure the Bohr model of nitrogen, nitrogen have 7 electrons as you see and with electron distribution of 1 s 2 2 s 2 2 p 3. This is the lowest unoccupied orbital picture of benzene. You see the delocalized electrons of the pi system. So, these type of systems are actually good and we will see the transitions which are allowed. So, as I told homo the highest occupied molecular orbital, lumo the lowest unoccupied molecular orbital, the type of electronic transition happened sigma pi and n electrons. So, sigma pi and n electrons are mostly applied to organics, d and f electrons inorganics and organometallics, charge transfer for complexes. So, possible electronic transition applied to any type of any form of spectroscopy sigma to sigma star pi to pi star transition n to sigma star transition n to pi star transition sigma to pi star transition and pi to sigma star transition. So, if you see sigma is the sigma bond, pi is the pi bond. So, sigma is for bonding, pi is for bonding, n is for non-bonding pi star is for anti bonding and sigma star is for anti bonding. Sigma is the most stable, sigma star is the most unstable, pi is the second stable, pi star is the second most unstable in between there is non bonding. These are the 5 layers. So, as I told there are so many transition possible from here sigma to sigma star, sigma to pi star these are allowable, but then there are other ones as I told pi to sigma star and then pi to pi star, n to pi star, n to sigma star. So, n to pi star and pi to pi star transition most common transition observed in organic molecular UVVs observed in compound with lone pairs and multiple bonds with lambda max within 200 to 600 nanometer are common or facile for those electronic transition to be happened. So, we know that the three regions UV then visible then IR. So, UV visible spectroscopy is 
visible and UV. So, basic UV visible spectrophotometer acquired data in the 190 to 800, which is covering UV and V's range and can be designed as a flow system. Okay. How it work? We have discussed about Beer Lambert's law, it actually uh, main principle by which it work is the calculation of that in terms of transmittance and absorbance. So, transmittance equal to I 0, you have to know I 0 and I 1. So, transmittance equal to I 1 by I 0, I 0 is the initial intensity, we have talked about that and I 1 is the change intensity. So, this is equal to 10 to the power minus A, A is the absorbance, again we talked about this, A equal to alpha L C, where alpha or epsilon is the molar extinction coefficient, L is the path length and C is the concentration. So, this is the sample the cubit, its width is the path length L, the concentration of the sample which you are putting here and using that we could have calculate all the possible parameters alpha or epsilon equal to 4 pi k by lambda. So, the chromophores in protein one the peptidic bond uh, it could be the peptide bond is the amide bond we know that this is having a lone pair because nitrogen is 1 S 2 to S 2 to P 3. So, if you look at there is in ground state in excited state it forms the S P 3 orbital where there is so, there is one lone pair, this lone pair is there, it contributed and get a partial double bond in the amide of the peptide bond. This peptide bond is the basic unit of protein. So, we will discuss FTIR, Raman, you will get specific amide band. UV it is also sensible, we will talk about at giving characteristic spectra at 280 nanometer. Aromatic amino acid gives spectra at 260 to 300 nanometer and then there are attached probes which are varies according to their property, according to their binding and all these things. There are probes used for colorimetric analysis, uh, when I, I say colorimetric analysis, then let us say you have an enzyme and the enzyme could break a bond. If there is a compound which produce color when the bond breaks this is used for colorimetric analysis as a probe. Then there is UV active assays like there are some probes which are having changes like again a substrate having A B bond and the A B bond breaks and this is UV inactive, 
this is active or there is any spectral shift. This type of compounds are used as UV active or differentiative probe. An example we generally use is nitrosephine. Nitrosephine is a compound which change color, which change color when it is attacked by the enzyme called beta lactamase. The pale yellow color change to bright red. So, this could be used as a colorimetric probe in the visible range. So, these type of things are important in study using UV visible spectroscopy. For protein a quick but less specific measure of protein concentration is the absorbance of the sample at 280 nanometer as I was talking about at 280 nanometer around the protein have a peak and then they have other peaks for aromatic amino acids phenylalanine, tryptophan and tyrosine. Most protein have an absorbance maxima at 280 nanometer as opposed to nucleic acid at 260 nanometer. This property is utilized for quick determination of concentration of a protein when we are working in the laboratory. Aromatic residues such as tryptophan, tyrosine, phenylalanine are responsible for the observed absorbance thus protein lacking these residues cannot be measured using this assay. Although nucleic acid contamination can interfere with measuring protein concentration at 280 nanometer, a more accurate measure can be taken by measuring the absorbance of the sample at both 260 and 280 nanometer and using the following calculation. So, protein concentration equal to 1.55. So, this should be here absorbance as 280 minus 0 0.76 into absorbance at 260. So, this is factor A minus factor B, it is a very accurate calculation that is usually used in laboratory condition. I will not talk a lot about, but one thing I have to say here one of the very good application of spectroscopy is enzyme kinetics. I was talking about the visible color based probes and UV based probes in the reaction as I told where there is a change directly the enzyme reacts and change the spectral property. They are called direct probes, but there are indirect probes where you have one enzyme of interest it makes a change to compound A, which is not suppose it change ATP to ADP. This is not colorimetric, but this ADP is changing or taking part in a reaction with enzyme B, which is making a color then this is used as a secondary enzyme in the assay and this is called indirect probe. How the enzyme catalysis is measured? So, the change of spectra would be calculated with time, calculated with time 
So, now you have spectral change let us say per second with a certain concentration of the enzyme. In saturation kinetics from there you could measure k cat, you could also measure k m, k cat by k m is the measure of the efficiency of the enzyme. You could also assay the inhibitors measuring k i, you could measure the effect of specially reversible inhibitors by different type of assays like competitive, non-competitive and uncompetitive assays. So, UV with spectroscopy uh, in a general setup you have a sample holder and a reference holder, but in the spectroscopy instrument which is used for kinetics there are multiple holders are present you use different qubits let us say you, you could use up to 18 qubits in general setups. So, you take 18 qubits you take 6 different concentration of enzyme keeping the substrate concentration and other things fixed and from the rate you get you could calculate k cat k m. Also, if you want to inhibit, you could calculate k i. In that way, UV visible spectroscopy is playing a major role in enzyme kinetics, in small molecule kinetics, photochemistry and many other things. Coming to the technique circular dichroism. To introduce circular dichroism, circular dichroism is a type of absorption spectroscopy that can provide information on the structure of many type of biological macromolecules. It generally measures the difference between the absorption of left and light handed circularly polarized light by protein. So, this is a new thing because we are talking about change of intensity directly in a linearly polarized light. I am talking about the concepts. Here we are introducing a concept which is called circularly polarized light and from there the technique is called circular dichroism. So, let us see how this bring new things here. Application of CD in biology protein structure determination it is very good in determining the secondary structure of protein and associated changes. Changes are important because the high resolution structures generally do not give you a lot of experiment with changes. We talked about NMR, NMR gives you changes, but as we also talked about NMR is very expensive, CD is very, very cheap. Induced structure change as I was talking about with pH, with heat, with solvent, with denaturing agent anything any changes you could trap in CD. Protein folding and unfolding, protein unfolding assay is a very popular assay taken care by CD, we will talk about that. Ligand binding, if there is a induced change after binding to the ligand then you could see that. Structural aspect of nucleic acids, polysaccharides, peptides, hormones and other small molecules. So, CD is very informative. So, we are talking about circularly polarized light. So, we are going into that concept. Let us start with unpolarized radiation. Light or other electromagnetic radiation from many sources such as sun, flames and incandescent lamp consist of short wave trends with an equal mixture of polarization. So, they have light in going in all different you know directions. This is called unpolarized light. Oscillation which takes place in transverse wave in many different direction is said to be unpolarized. Now, if the oscillation does take place in only one direction, then the wave is said to be linearly polarized or plane polarized in that direction. What happened? 
the wave is coming if you see this is the wave it is coming and it is oscillating in one direction. So, traveling in one direction because wave would be coming in a wavy way right. So, it goes in that way if you see you, you would get like this. This is plane polarized light most of the spectroscopy is dependent on the plane polarized light ok. What is polarization? A light source usually consists of a collection of randomly oriented emitters. So, it goes in different direction. The emitted light is a collection of waves with all possible orientation of the E vector. You remember we talked about electromagnetic wave, it is having an electric part and a magnetic part. We are now talking about the E vector which is the electric one. Plane polarized light or electromagnetic radiation is obtained by passing that through a polarizer. So, you are passing the light through a instrument or setup it is called polarizer that transmit them with only a single plane of polarization. So, it is going into different direction let us say different direction. If giving something is making it going in one direction, then this is called a polarizer. So, you see this is the E vectors they are going into many direction and the polarizer takes them and convert them to travel in only one direction. So, this is now unidirectional as I was talking about this is electric vector and this is magnetic vector and this is going in one direction. So, this is electromagnetic wave and this direction is here. So, this is also having unidirection and this is called the polarized light or plane polarized light. So, this is the polarized light. A polarizer is an optical filter that lets light wave of a specific polarization pass through while blocking light waves of the other polarization. It can filter a beam of light of undefined or mixed polarization into a beam of well defined polarization and that is called polarized light. The common type of polarizers are linear polarizer and circular polarizers. Polarizers are used in many optical techniques and instrument and polarizing filters find application in photography definitely you have heard about blue filter and all these things colors and LCD technology especially this new technology where this optical filters are used. Polarizer can also be made of other type of electromagnetic wave beside the visible wave we, which we are talking about microwave, radio wave, x-rays and all these things. So, an example is if you use it you would understand it very well that is a polaroid spec. When you have a polaroid spec, if you see here, there are different directional beam coming right here, light wave vibrating parallel to the highway. So, this is one light wave is vibrating parallel to the highway and this is to the perpendicular, perpendicular to the highway. So, there are two types when you have this spec it block this one and it allow this one it make this one plane polarized this is called polarizer any electromagnetic wave consists of an electric field component and magnetic field component the electric field component is used to define the plane of polarization because many common electromagnetic wave detector respond to electric forces on electrons in material 
not the magnetic forces. So, generally we look at the electronic vector. Polarization of light by selective absorption is analogous to the shown diagram which is picket fence analogy diagram. So, if you see there are two fence this wooden structures they maintain gaps, but when they are aligned and here they are not aligned. So, what will be the difference? When the picket of both fences are aligned in the vertical direction, a vertical vibration can make through both the fences. But in this case, when the pickets of second fences are in horizontal direction, a vertical vibration can make through the first phase and will be blocked in the second one. So, that is how you could have blocked some specific waves or in other word you could have allowed some specific waves to go and when you have blocked almost all the waves and allowed one single this is called plain polarized light. Elliptical, linear and circular polarization. As I talked about different type of polarization in electrodynamics the elliptical polarization is the polarization of the electromagnetic radiation such that the tip of the electric field vector describes an ellipse in any fixed plane intersecting and normal to the direction of the propagation. So, it is propagating it form a elliptical development. We will talk about elliptical polarization. In elliptical polarization, there are two special cases one is linear polarization and another is circular polarization. So, linear polarization which we have already discussed or plane polarization of electromagnetic radiation is a confinement of the electric field vector or magnetic field vector to a given plane along the direction of the propagation. We have already talked about this. Circular polarization of the electromagnetic wave, it is a polarization state in which at each point the electromagnetic field of the wave has a constant magnitude and is rotating at a constant rate in a plane perpendicular to the direction of the wave. So, whereas this one is only perpendicular, this one is rotating that is why it is circular polarization. So, if you are looking at this you could understand this is the linear polarization. So, if you look at so this is the actual one the elliptical polarization, but here only right hand polarization is recorded. So, when it is rotating it rotated to right right hand and left hand. So, this is if you look at this the wave is propagating and if you try to put the vectors you see that they are traveling in the perpendicular of the propagation pathway forming an elliptical form. This is same when the ellipse develops. So, ellipse could be of any type when the ellipse is going to form a circle that is a circular one, it would also have left handed and right handed two types. And if you follow the wave, you will also get a circle. This is what used in circular dichroism and in linear you see that it is developing a perpendicular line. Now, if you come here you will see that how the propagation of the wave is working here. You see this is the pathway at a given point two orthogonal waves are there and they are rotating. When they are superposed, the resulting wave lies in a plane. 
and when you get the resultant wave this is linearly polarized. when instead of being there it rotate you get circular or circularly polarized. So, rotation here you see the rotation in electrodynamics the strength and direction of an electric field is defined by its electric field vector we have talked earlier. In the case of circularly polarized wave the tip of the electric field vector at a given point in space relates to the phase of the light as it travels through time and space. At any instant of time the electric field vector to the wave indicates a point on a helix oriented along the direction of the propagation. If you see here it shows the shape development of a helix. A circularly polarized wave can rotate in one of the two possible senses clockwise or right handed circular polarization which is RHCP in which the electric field vector rotate in a right hand sense with respect to the direction of the propagation. Counterclockwise in the other one this is left handed circular polarization or LHCP in which the vector rotates in a left handed sense. So, if you look at this one and this one you could understand that they are working in two different direction. And what is the interesting point here if you apply the rotation and you get a differentiation between the right handed circular polarization and the left handed circular polarization how you get it you will get it for a optically active molecule a optically active molecule is called a chiral molecule like our hand you cannot put it superposing to one another similarly if you take a carbon you have four hands then what will happen if you draw a plane like if you draw this plane one would be above and other would be below the plane. So, if one structure is this being a b other structure is this being b a these are called optically active compound and if you have optically active compound you get differential dichroic differential theta when you pass through light hand circular polarization and left hand circular polarization. Now, if you understand that come to protein you know that protein have 20 amino acids among these 20 amino acid 19 amino acids are chiral. So, that is what circular dichroism becoming so popular and so interesting in the study of protein molecule. So, the plane polarized light is obtained by passing light through a polarizer as we talked about polarizer earlier that transmit light with only a single plane of polarization. It passes only those components of the E vector that are parallel to the axis. This is the propagation only the polarizer on the parallel axis so that perpendicular to the propagation direction. Circular polarized light the E vector of two electromagnetic wave are one four wavelength out of phase and are perpendicular the vector that is the sum of the E vector of the two component rotate so that it tip follows a helical path you will see that in the dotted line and coming to the linearly and circularly polarized light comparison for the linearly polarized light the electric vector direction constant magnitude varies. So, you could see this is where I was talking about see this is reducing here and also here this is reducing, but they are 
in the same line. Circularly polarized light, the electric vector direction varies magnitude constant. So, here you see this is rotating around. So, the electric vector direction varies, the magnitude is constant. So, it is in two form left and right handed. You see this is right hand, this is left handed rotations. So, as I discussed now the circular dichroism instrument the C D measures the difference between the absorption of left and right handed circularly polarized light. So, this is the dichroism which it measures you see there is a right and left handed circularly polarized light. This is the photon beam when you put the optically active compound you get the C D signal where the preferential absorption of the right hand polarization over left hand polarization which could be different also. One of the problem with this technique is this is measured as a function of wavelength and the difference of the wavelength between left and right is always very small 1 by 10,000 of the total. After passing through the sample the left and right beams have different amplitudes. Also the combination of the two unequal beams give elliptical polarized light which we talked about. Hence C D measures the ellipticity of the transmitted light the light that remain and not absorbed. So, again the measurement here is also absorption spectroscopy. So, same way though uh, C D could operate in other region too, sign light through a sample and measure the proportion absorbed as a function of wavelength. Absorbance we have already talked many time equal to log I 0 by I or I 1, I 0 is the initial intensity and I is the after the absorbance. So, the Beer Lambert law is applicable here A equal to epsilon or alpha L C. E equal to extinction coefficient absorbance is directly proportional to concentration C of absorbing species in the sample and path length of the light L through the sample. The longer the path or more concentrated the sample the higher the absorbance. So, it is the same principle we are talking about in UV it is also used here. C D measures the difference between the absorption of left and right handed circularly polarized light. So, del A which is a function of lambda equal to A r minus A l which equal to epsilon r minus epsilon l l c or you could also say del epsilon l c. Del epsilon is the difference in the extinction coefficient typically less than 10 per molar per centimeter typically epsilon is around 20,000 per mole per centimeter. The C D signal as we have discussed earlier also is a very small difference between two large originals. C D is only observed at wavelengths where absorption occurs in absorption bands. C D arises because of the interaction between different transition dipoles during the absorption as this depends on the relative orientation of different groups in space. The signal is very sensitive to the conformation and that is why it is very critical for studying protein. So, in general del epsilon is much more conformation dependent than epsilon. We will concentrate on electronic C D of peptide and protein below. 250 nanometer. This region is dominated by the absorption of peptide bond and is sensitive to changes in secondary structures, but we also will look at other possibilities. Can also do C D in near UV look at tryptophan side chains visible for the cofactors and IR regions. The peptide bond is inherently asymmetric and always optically active. Any optical activity from side chain chromophores is induced and result from the interaction with asymmetrical neighboring groups. So, this is the amide bond as we told this amide this is one of the reason of 
CD being so successful. Coming to some examples, CD signal is small difference between two large originals as we talk about. This is the circular dichroism of E. coli, this is the native one and this is the denatured one. So, as we told in case of nucleic acid, we do the absorption at 260 nanometer del epsilon equal to 3 per mole per centimeter, whereas epsilon is 6000 per mole per centimeter. So, CD signal is 0.05 percent of original need to measure signals. So, it is only 0.05 percent. So, it need to measure the signal at 1 by 100 of the currently used one. So, if you see that here the absorption it is high whereas, when you are doing the CD the difference is not at all high the del epsilon is not at all high and that is why what we need we need different setup. There are different types of CD circular dichroism as I talked about is an absorption spectroscopy method based on the differential absorption of left and right circularly polarized light. Optically active chiral molecules will preferably absorb one direction of the circularly polarized light. The difference in absorption of the left and right circularly polarized light can be measured and also could be quantified. UV CD is used to determine aspect of protein secondary structure. We are talking about mostly visible, but UV CD is determined secondary structures. Vibrational CD, IR CD is used to study structure of small organic molecules, proteins, and DNA. UVB CD investigates charge transfer transitions in metal protein complexes. So, looking at CD signals of different secondary structures, this is a graph, the x axis is wavelength in nanometer and the y axis is mean residue ellipticity in degree centimeter square and d mole inverse. So, this is the plot you see that the two part when E L minus E R is less than 0 and E L minus E R is greater than 0, the electronic transition in left and right. So, the black bold is alpha helix, the blue dotted are beta sheet and the dotted line is random coil. So, these are standard plots, these are Fassman standard car for polylysine in different environment. If you see there are two type of bands negative band and positive band if you go back here this is negative band and this is positive band. So, bands are in nanometer for alpha helix 222208 negative band 192 is positive band for beta sheet 216 is negative band 195 is positive band for beta turn 220 to 230 is the negative band and 180 so that is weak 180 to 190 is strong and positive band is at 205 for poly pro uh, 2 helix a special type of uh, polyproline type helix 190 negative band 210 to 230 weak positive band for random coil a negative band at 200. So, these are fingerprints, these are characteristic bands for different secondary structures. Based on those peaks, we could do a lot of experiment. For example, we know that for alpha helix, we have negative band at 222 and 208 and positive band at 192. So, let us say this positive band is here. Now, if we add temperature, there would be denaturation. By denaturation, the alpha helix 
would be converted to more or less coil random coil. So, there would be change and the relative change could be plotted plotted to get a curve like that and the middle would be melting temperature. So, in that way the fingerprints could be used for other work. Let us take a example where CD signals are sensitive to secondary structures. So, this is GCN 4 P 1 it is a coil coil if you see this is the alpha helix this is the alpha helix. So, it is a coil coil it is 100 percent helical at 0 degree centigrade it maintain that secondary structure it melts to a random coil at high temperature. So, this alpha helical structure is converted to random coil when you provide temperature. For doing this experiment, this is taken from a literature where 34 micro molar of GCNP P1 in 0 0.15 molar NaCl, 10 millimolar phosphate and 7 pH is maintained. It kept at 0 degree centigrade, it is heated at 75 degree centigrade and, and 50 degree centigrade. So, 0, 50, 75 and when it was plot against wavelength and mean residue ellipticity, you see that at 0 degree it maintain the helical structure. Whereas, at 50 degree it is deviated at 70 it is mostly random coil. So, by this way if you take more points you could actually calculate the melting temperature which I am talking about. So, this is a very important experiment because this is not only for this protein it could be done in any protein and because this is based on the fingerprint. So, you could have very accurately calculate them also you could your experiment is not restricted to temperature it would be going to pH it would be going to anything that that could deviate the structure that could deviate the conformation. So, application of CD in structural biology it is helping as we have see here determination of the secondary structure of the protein that cannot be crystallize or you do not get enema structure. Investigation of the effect of drug binding on protein secondary structures as drug binding change the conformation. So, we could study that dynamic process such as protein folding as I told you have a protein and you start putting high temperature high pH you see protein unfold. Similarly, you have a unfolded protein and you are kind of removing the condition which is causing the unfolding then it would start folding and you will get to see the change in the conformation. Studies of the effect of environment of protein structure, secondary structure, super secondary structure of membrane proteins, study of ligand induced conformational change of the protein, carbohydrate, carbohydrate it is having very I would say different and unpredicted conformations, but is there a change in conformation uh, you could determine that with CD. Why carbohydrate have a lot of conformation I have talked about when I was talking about biological macromolecules carbohydrate because of their forming of straight chain bond, branch chain bond. So, straight chain branch chain and when they form the folded structure it could be of any combination and permutation. So, it is very difficult to detect or predict it otherwise CD is a good method to do that. Investigation of protein, protein and protein nucleic acid interaction, interaction makes changes especially when macromolecules are interacting they make changes in the conformation that change is reflected on the 
CD structure. Fold recognition if you have a standard data for alpha, for beta, for different super secondary structures, this will help you to detect super secondary fold or a particular characteristic fold in protein. Why use CD? First, very simple, very quick experiments, no extensive preparation, you just have a pure protein, you put it in proper buffer and do the experiment. Measurement on solution phase throughout the experiment, throughout the course, we are trying to convince you guys that when you are putting your protein at a specific state like a crystal, that is not giving you the information which is biologically relevant. Crystallography definitely gives you the coordinate of a protein, it is best thermodynamics form, but it is not as good as solution structure. CD could be studied in solution phase, so that is one other advantage. Relatively low concentration, it is a sensitive technique. The amount of sample you could also need is very low. The CD uh, qubit if you see are very small and you could use small amount of protein. Microsecond time resolution, so that is also one very important thing. Any size of macromolecule, size dependence are there in different techniques. NMR cannot be working with bigger macromolecules. Cryo electron microscopy we are going to study will not work with smaller molecules. X ray cannot work if crystallization does not happen. CD, anything and everything. This is where we are shifting from a particular secondary structure to a proper protein. So, four proteins are taken. What are the four proteins? One is myoglobin, which you see is all alpha. You could see here only alpha helices connected to loop, right? Here, Trios phosphate isomerase you could see alpha mostly, but there are beta also. Here you have lysozyme, beta, you have alpha. Here it is only 1, 3, 10 helix, all the so mostly beta. So, here mostly alpha, few beta and here alpha and beta. So, when you plot them, you see a characteristic part for all alpha, you get a big peak here. So, there is progressive change in theta 222 as the amount of helix increases from chymotrypsin to myoglobin. So, if you See here, you will see that this point and this point, this is 222. You see that for this is myoglobin, this is triose phosphate isomerase, this is lysozyme, and this is chymotrypsin. So, if you see as I told about myoglobin all alpha, triosphosphate isomerase having mostly alpha, lysozyme having mix of alpha, beta and chymotrypsin beta. So, with the alpha increase, peak length increase, with beta increase, peak length decrease. So, we get a overall fit, a tendency. And these type of data are actually calculated and now they are used for determining unknown secondary structure. How? When you put wavelength in nanometer and all of these things, this is a particular graph calculate the percentage of secondary structure by fitting the unknown curve theta u to a combination of standard curve. 
in the simplest case use the Fassman standard we already know in Fassman standard polylysine curve and many other curves are actually used. So, the formula uses theta t theta total equal to x alpha theta alpha x beta theta beta x c theta c where alpha is the alpha helix contribution beta is the beta sit combination and c is the random coil. Now, there would be varying alpha, beta and coils. This will give the best fit of all the thetas. And if you consider x alpha, x beta plus x c, the contribution of alpha, beta and coil equal to 1, that is equal to 100, you could say. We could calculate this by least square minimization. What is least square minimization? If you have experimentally these dots, the process you could develop a curve which will fit the maximum is called least square minimization. A little bit knowledge see how this all these dots it are uh, put under x y. So, the line is taken in such a way. So, if the line is chosen it is not from 0 because if it would be drawn from 0 then it would not get the maximum dots. So, the least square method is a form of mathematical regression analysis used to determine the line of best fit for a set of data providing a visual demonstration of the relationship between the data points. Each point of data represents the relationship between a known independent variable and an unknown dependable variable. The least square method is a statistical procedure to find the best fit for a set of data points by minimizing the sum of the offsets or residual of points from the plotted curve. Least square regression is used to predict the behavior of dependent variables. So, here we get a lot of standard data put them and then put our unknown and determine there. So, example of fit we take myoglobin as a example. The formula is theta total equals to x alpha theta alpha x beta theta beta plus x c or x coil theta coil. The fit gives us idea like the fit gives the best point where x alpha equal to 80, x beta equal to 0 and x coil equal to 20. So, from the linear regression calculation this was found and this is myoglobin you see most of the part are alpha. So, the determination is not bad and there are coils too. So, let us see what is the actual prediction from the high resolution structure. It agrees well with the secondary structure calculation from high resolution structure 78 percent helix and 22 percent coil. So, this x alpha 80 is very close to 78 and 22 is also close to x coil and there is no beta sheet. But, so this is perfect, this is ideal condition but the CD signal depends somewhat on environment, we will discuss that point. We can see this by looking at the effect of trifluoroethanol TFE on a coil coil similar to GCN 4 P 1. So, we have taken these and other structures. TFE trifluoroethanol induces helicity in all peptides. So, if you take any peptide and uh, you introduce 50 percent TFE, you see TFE is making a change from this peptide to that peptide it is more helical, right. But, so TFE induces helicity in all peptides, if you see here it induces, induces helicity that is correct. At the same time coil coil breaks down helical dimer to single helices. So, to make a model we take this 
G C N 4 P 1 coil dimer with single coil. And measure we have seen that they maintain same secondary structure. There are many different algorithms all rely on using up to 20 CD spectra of protein of, of known structure. By mixing those together a fit spectra is obtained for an unknown. So, there are different softwares I recommend for these to go for Dicro web the online CD analysis tool the link is given here can generally get accuracies for 97 percent for helices, helices calculation is always easy because of their stability 75 percent for beta sheet, 50 percent for turns and 89 percent for other structure types. So, low for turns but you know it is low because turn or coil itself does not have a confident secondary structure. There are tools for analyzing circular dichroism data, few tools I am recommending Lincom and MLR the method of least squares, CONTIN the ridge regression procedure of Provencher and Glockner, VARSLC the variable selection method of Johnson and co-workers, Selcon the self consistent method of Sri Rama and Udi, K2D dot a neural network program of Andre et al, CCA the convex constraint algorithm of Fassman and co-worker, SVD the singular value decomposition. There are limitation of the uh, CD method in secondary structure analysis. The simple deconvolution of CD spectrum into 4 or 5 components which do not vary from one protein to another is a very gross oversimplification. The reference CD spectra corresponding to 100 percent helix, seed, turn, etcetera are not directly applicable to protein which contain short sections of the various structures. The CD of an alpha helix is known to increase with increasing helix length. CD of beta seed are very sensitive to environment and geometry and their CD spectra calculation never works. The far UV curves greater than 275 nanometer can contain contribution from aromatic amino acids in practice CD is measured at wavelengths below this. The shapes of four UV CD cups depend on tertiary as well as secondary structures. Some practicalities to work CD is based on measuring a very small difference between two large signals must be done carefully. The absorbance must be reasonable max between 0 0.5 to 1.5, quartz cell which is shown here, path length between 0 0.0001 centimeter and 10 centimeter, 1 centimeter and 0.1 centimeter are common, have to be careful with buffer, trees bad it have high UV absorption. So, trees buffer you cannot use in the CD spectroscopy, we generally use phosphate buffer, but you could use other buffers too. Measure cell baseline with solvent it is very critical, then sample with same cell inserted same way around. Turbidity kills, uh, so filter the solutions, everything has to be very, very clean for accurate secondary structure estimation must know the concentration of the sample. Some typical condition for getting good circular dichroism protein concentration 0 0.25 milligram per ml cell path length 1 millimeter volume 400 microliter but depending on the CD cubet need very little sample 0 0.1. Uh, milligram concentrations are 
pretty reasonable. Stabilizers, metal ions, etc., should be used minimum. Buffer concentration 5 millimolar or as low as possible while maintaining protein stability. Because if you do not maintain the protein stability, your experiment is not going to work. But so, protein stability is the most important thing you have to maintain the protein stability, but while you are maintaining the protein stability you should not forget that these other stabilizers have, the, have their own CD properties. A structural biology method that can give real answers in one day. So, summarizing CD is a useful method for looking at secondary structures of proteins and peptides. It is an adaptation of standard absorption spectroscopy in which the difference in the absorption between left and right and circularly polarized light is measured. CD can be measured under a wide range of conditions. It is very good for membrane proteins. We did not discuss about membrane proteins uh, in this module, but CD is very differently applied and as membrane proteins are difficult to study. So, this is one of the very interesting part of CD. CD can be used to measure change. CD complements other more detailed techniques such as X-ray crystallography. The findings in X-ray crystallography would be very well coordinated with the CD structures. So, with this I have talked about UV absorptions, UV visible absorption and CD. These are techniques which have take a very important part in determining different properties of protein. As I told UV vis is especially important for operating or regulating reactions, enzyme assay, enzyme catalysis. CD is good because a different approach is taken here where all the spectroscopy is based on linearly polarized light here circularly polarized light and their difference is taken. So, especially for protein CD is very critical and CD experiments are really informative. With that I would finish today's talk as I told earlier keep listening to the classes and keep asking questions to us. Thank you very much.